My first question is, do you, do you want me to use the microphone? I'm usually a pretty loud guy by myself. Otherwise, I can stand up here and look like we're giving a spelling bee, if you'd like. <laughs> I hide behind the microphone. Yeah, I, would, I, uh, I actually just finished giving a lecture this weekend. I teach functional nutrition to other doctors as well. So I just got done with a 16-hour lecture down in Houston. So uh, one of the things they had to keep reminding me is, number one, this is, we do not have 16 hours, so. <laughs> uh, the handouts that I gave you are fairly uh, condensed. Uh, so there's a lot of information there we're gonna kinda go, kinda go over. Uh, suffice it to say, it's not gonna cover everything about neuropathy, but I wanna give you some, some large points about natural perspectives and natural approaches towards it. We're gonna talk a lot about pharmaceuticals and how they play into that as well. Um, He's, don't worry, the NSA's got me either way. We're good. All right, so, so I, will try to keep, I will try to keep this relatively brief. Um, and as we move through each slide, there's a lot of information on them. So what I'm going to try to do is kind of give you the, the big picture to take home from each one of these. I'm not asking you to be experts in these, uh, in these slides. I want to give you stuff to be able to chew on when you go home as well. So today we're going to talk about natural perspectives in, neurop in neuropathy. Uh, my name is Dr. Victor Karsrud. I'm board certified in internal medicine, family practice, and clinical nutrition. I also sit on the National Board of Pharmacology and Toxicology for the ACA CDID. Um, and one of the things we do is a lot, of, uh, a lot of information about the interactions between various drugs and various nutrients um, and how various drugs can deplete various nutrients from your body. So for example, that's the mechanism of action by which a lot of pharmaceuticals end up actually generating some neuropathy. Um, when I'm not doing this or I'm not uh, seeing patients, I'm co-hosting our radio shows on the weekends. Um, you can listen to Let's Get Healthy on 1370 or stream it through our website. Uh, and I'm former adjunct faculty of the Academy of Oriental Medicine in Austin. Um, I do believe that if you, one of the things when you're talking about alternative therapies, you've had other groups in before that have talked about the usefulness of acupuncture, um, that acupuncture has a lot of good data behind it in terms of helping people with various forms of neuropathies throughout their bodies. Um, as we wrap up today, I will also talk briefly about this last point. Um, I'm a national speaker for a couple of different uh, organizations on neuromethylation, uh, nutrigenomics, and overall methylation cascades in the body, which is basically how your body turns on or off various parts of your DNA. And we're going to get into some pretty hairy biochemistry toward the end, but don't worry, it's not as complicated as it sounds. So, so the thing about neuropathy is that neuropathy is like, it's, it's a description. It's not telling you why it's going on. And for, you know, for the dozen and a half people we may have sitting in the room, uh, I can guarantee that not all of you have uh, the same cause. Now, you may be similar. There may be blood sugar dysregulation or uh, maybe some, uh, some toxicities and maybe some global inflammations, et cetera. But the combination of factors is slightly different from person to person. And the problem with neuropathy is that you can't throw this blanket umbrella out there and expect you know, a, a description to necessarily reflect treatment plans for every individual that's gonna work. We're all biochemically individual. So your first take home from today, today's lecture is that realize that things that may work for your friend won't necessarily work for you and vice versa. You're an individual, you've got individual needs, you got changes in your DNA from person to person, and as a consequence, you have to be able to reflect that biochemical individuality when you're seeing about your possible causes. Now, uh, I'm not gonna go into great detail because you've had other speakers, and there are certain other, other speakers around there who will talk about uh, more conventional causes, for example, uh, diabetic neuropathies, for example, being the most, one of the most common. Um, and those, a lot of those fall under lifestyle causations. Um, these can be, you know, either choices we made or did not make, you know, do I pick up the Twinkie, do I leave the Twinkie, <laughs> take the cannoli, leave the cannoli. My jokes do not get any better, folks. It's gonna be a long, it's gonna be a long hour for you. All right. <laughs> All right. Um, you know, and for some, for example, it may be B12 deficiencies. This is one of the most uh, notorious neuropathies in, in the literature. It may be neuropathies caused from, uh, from alcohol usage, um, or it could be toxic exposures, if they, you know, uh, anti-cancer medications, etc. So what I'm saying is your lifestyle plays a large part into this. There are various nutrients that are required to keep those uh, those nerve cells operating, things like B12 and your essential fatty acids, particularly your omega-3s. So anything that helps deplete those, particularly your medications, needs to be needs to be observed. There are various other disease states that can cause these as well. So don't assume that your thyroid dysfunction or your celiac disease or your rheumatoid arthritis or any of the rest of these are operating
operating in a bubble under themselves. The biggest issue we've got in, in modern medicine is that specialists get paid really well, but they don't see the entire person. And as a consequence, they miss the fact that all these little things that may be happening to you may have seven different doctors attached to them, but that doesn't mean it's not just multiple manifestations of the same underlying condition. In natural medicine, we say, look for causes, not for symptoms. So look at your other disease states, look at your diet. We'll talk briefly about the autoimmune component and how it's tied up with what you decide to eat. So hang on to that for a minute. Of course, various infections and trauma can cause it. And then a big one is look for various medication-induced depletions. Now, there was a book that came out a couple of years ago um, by Ross Pelton and Jim Laval called The Drug-Induced Nutritional Handbook. Um, and it's, it, it was a very small little tome, cost about $25 uh, when it first came out. And it basically listed out everything in the literature about how various medications deplete nutrients that we need out of our bodies. Um, the AMA hunted that book to the edge of extinction. Um, and last time I checked on Amazon, it cost about $400. Now. Jim Laval is that sort of, well, I'm going to, be, I'm going to shake, stand on top of the parapets and shake my fist at the oncoming horde sort of guy. So he basically, okay, I can't publish that one book, so I'll just, public, I'll just publish all that information in the back of all of my other books. So usually it's like Appendix A. Um, and if you want to, like I said, go out and just look up Jim Laval and almost anything that he's got. We'll document these. Now, of these depletions, there are several out there that, need, that we need to talk about briefly. So if you're on one of these, keep it in mind. For example, if you're on statin medications, and this is one of the top two prescribed medications in the United States, um, statins are notorious for blocking what we call HMG coenzyme reductase, which is a really fancy way of saying it blocks off how your body produces cholesterol. Now, ignoring the data out there which is showing that that blockage doesn't necessarily give you clinical benefit, that's another discussion. Um, one thing we do know that it does is deplete your body of coenzyme Q10. Now, coenzyme Q10 keeps your mitochondria running, and your mitochondria give your, cell, your cells all the energy they need to operate. Well, your nerves in particular require an awful lot of those things to be operational, and it's not uncommon to see statins generate neuropathy as well as various other neurologic conditions. Uh, there was a book written a couple of years ago by a former astronaut from NASA called Lipitor, Thief of Memory, talking about its implications in both memory lapses and Alzheimer's disease. So if you're on a statin medication, you better believe that's probably having at least some impact. Now, what do you do? Well, I can't pull you off those meds, and I always suggest if you're going to talk about altering any medications, talk with your MDs. But the one thing you want to do is start off with CoQ10. It'll help revitalize those mitochondria. It's not going to hurt you. Um, there are studies using CoQ10 up to a gram and a half a day to fight Alzheimer's, rather successfully, I'll mention. So if you're on a statin medication, I'd say somewhere between two and 400 milligrams a day of CoQ10 is a good place to start, for example. If you're on various hypertensive medications, and the blood pressure's creeping up a little bit, you know, maybe you got stuck on Mopac driving here or something like that, the blood pressure's rising and rising, they'll put you on you know, any one of a number, a number of medications, and most of those have been shown to deplete the same CoQ10 as well as magnesium. My old nutrition professor used to say, magnesium has 350 uses in the body. Um, therefore, if, you know, if he was stuck on a desert island, it would, the only thing he'd have with him would be a bottle of magnesium. My response was, I want a two-way radio, but I'm a clearer thinker, right? <laughs> magnesium relaxes your brain, relaxes your muscles, certainly helps reinvigorate your nerves, depending upon what kind of magnesium you're using. And we can help you kind of target that as well. Um, hormone replacement therapy, if it is imbalanced, can become very pro-inflammatory uh, pro in your body and deplete a lot of your B vitamins. We'll talk more about those B vitamins at the very, very end because I want to say uh, that's, that's kind of a special case. But so do your antibiotics. And anybody who's been taking long-term, anybody that's studied anything about your gut knows that most of your B vitamins are manufactured or processed through by your gut flora. Well, if I've been taking antibiotics because I got strep throat or if I've got um, you know, maybe a, a, a knee infection or a hip, hip replacement or something like that, um, I'm going to be loaded up with, with antibiotics. Well, those are going to deplete my B vitamins as well. And we know one of the big things that you have to have to keep those nerves functioning is activated B12. Well, without your gut flora, without your, your body's uh, gut running appropriately, you'll never get the B12, the B6, or the B9 that your nerves need to operate. And last but not least, you've got the, the acid blockers, the antacids, and these are just the top of the list. Um, and those block off any nutrient that requires acid for absorption. 
notably calcium, iron, and B12. Now, but it's not like we need those. I mean, the iron's just there for our blood and our immune system. The, you know, the, the calcium's there for our bones. That's okay, I'll sit in my recliner all day anyway. And B12 for my, my brain and my nerves, okay? We know long-term, and the reason we know this is because it is actually required that if you're put on those medications, read your factory inserts. I know, that's, that, that's the one thing that everybody kind of throws away. But it even says, if you're on an acid blocker, you shouldn't be on them more than, two, more than two weeks at a time because they know, and it is well documented, that it causes these depletions. So if you're on one of these medications long-term, you need to have a conversation with your physician about what long-term depletions may be going on because of it and what you should take to try to come off of it. Now, realize that your average MD has not got a lot of nutritional background, and that's okay. You know, I want them spending their time on how to put me back together after a car wreck as opposed to worrying about their B vitamin levels, okay? So if you're having problems, you may want to seek out somebody who's got a background in it. So step number one, be aware that your past medical background can give, can can tie into this as well. It's not just the neuropathy. And number two, the medications you may be on that are beneficial may actually have a side effect of depleting various nutrients you need to keep those nerves functioning. Now, the, any state in, of inflammation in your body can push forward neuropathy. Um, again, that inflammation depletes a lot of your nutrients out, and these include things like um, if you're diabetic, if you're using a lot of hydrogenated oils in your environment, if you've been exposed to a lot of toxins, by the way, chemotherapy agents are toxic. That's why they work the way they do. Um, so we need to talk about toxicity in a minute. If you've got uh, low omega-3s and high arachidonic acid, your omega-6s, if you're overweight, if you've been taking long-term medications or antibiotics, vaccinations have been shown to throw off neuropathy as well, particularly if there is already an autoimmune condition going on. Big red flag, guys. If you have any diagnosed autoimmune issue, whether that's rheumatoid arthritis, Sjogren's, multiple sclerosis, whatever else, you cannot take vaccinations. It's contraindicated by its very nature. So if they keep pushing you to take the yearly flu vaccine and you've got an, a positive ANA or a positive autoimmune condition, you shouldn't be taking that because it's going to mean that those vaccines are not going to work the way that they're supposed to. Um, talk to your physicians about it. Emotional stress, say, <laughs> Mere, merely the fact of having neuropathy usually gives you some degree of stress. Um, cigarette smoking, which goes back to the toxic, toxicities and various other inflammatory things in the body, including radiation, exposure to EMFs, or strong wireless signals, i.e., as you start tearing apart your, your environment, everything there that's not healthy for you, everything that's pro-inflammatory can contribute to this. Now, this hat doesn't have to be, well, this is the one thing and this is the one thing. It can be a little bit of this and a little bit of that. This is like the, this is like the smorgasbord of inflammation, right? So if I've got a high amount of stress and my diet isn't quite right and I've got a little autoimmune response going on, okay, and maybe, you know, my, my, uh, my wife is a heavy smoker. My wife is not a heavy smoker, but, you know, my wife's a heavy smoker and, she, you know, she's like puffing on cigarettes all day and I'm getting a lot of secondhand smoke, okay? These little things in combination often can be enough to keep you down. Modern medicine likes to focus on the idea that there's one causative agent, a magic bullet, but the truth is that there can be multiple things working against you. And like a combination lock, until you identify the combination of things that are getting you there, you may not be able to get yourself back to where you need to be. So how do we deal with these things? Let's start off with simple natural ways of, of reducing inflammation. Now, none of these are pharmaceuticals. Um, I do not readily, uh, readily recommend people starting and take, start taking the uh, corticosteroids or, or prednisone or something like that, because the natural ways of shutting off inflammation often are far more gentle. Uh, understand that prednisone and other corticosteroids will actually drop your immune system. That's not a great thing. What we need to do is find something that'll bring the, immune, uh, the inflammation back into a natural state of balance. Things like fish oil, and I mean a lot of fish oil, like two to six grams a day, depending upon what your bowels will take. Um, the average American needs to have an omega-3 to omega-6 ratio of about one to four. The average American is one to 40. So we are 10 times behind where we actually should be in terms of those omega-3s. Turmeric, um, active component of it is curcumin, and actually has been shown to shut off inflammation at the genetic level. Unlike any pharmaceutical known to man, which all deals with the manifestations of inflammation, turmeric and various other herbs have actually been shown to shut off the genetic, uh, the genetic bottleneck of that, called NF-kappa B, or nuclear factor kappa beta. Um, if you, are, uh, if you are, are uh, having neuropathy already, one of the things that they would suggest for you in Europe is this alpha-lipoic acid. Now, 
alpha lipoic acid is a standard for already for uh, neuropathy, but it's also used to reduce inflammation and it also balances out blood sugar. Kind of interesting. And what I usually suggest is somewhere between two to 300 milligrams three times a day. Now here's the problem. Alpha lipoic acid has a half-life of 90 minutes. So if it works for you, you're gonna be popping it like Pez about every two hours. Unless you get a controlled uptake or, or extended release alpha lipoic acid, which means you're only taking it two or three times a day as opposed to you know every two hours. Ma'am. Why don't, we grab, why don't we grab them toward the end, because sometimes I answer them in the next slide. Um, the next would be kind of a, a series of things to try to detox the body. So for those of you for whom there may be some toxic component of it, so you know, for, the, for the diabetic neuropathy, hit the ALA. Um, for anybody who's got a toxic exposure, or that may be part of it, you may want to add the next two or three things, including greens drinks. This include things like spirulina and chlorella. Um, they usually taste like lawn clippings, so you know, be careful what you choose. There, however, the great thing about it is there are a number of, of uh, nutraceutical companies that have actually produced greens drinks that taste pretty good. Um, there is one that my wife has become slightly addicted to that has an espresso flavor to it. And if the coffee fiend loves the, you know, the coffee flavored greens drinks, I can get all the, new, all the, uh, the vegetables and fruits that I need to earn in a, in a day, and she's getting a little bit of a caffeine fix on top of it. N-acetylcysteine, okay, NA, uh, that is NAC, is a precursor to glutathione, the one just above it. And these are big, big uh, detox uh, components from your liver, particularly in phase two detox. Uh, glutathione, it's a sulfur-bearing uh, moiety, so it kind of stinks a little bit. You got to be careful what you've got. But it is incredibly powerful at trying to detoxify the liver and the peripheral systems as well. Part of the reason we need to detox those is that a lot of these toxins that uh, damage, uh, damage the nerves are fat soluble. So we need fat soluble and high dose antioxidants like glutathione and NAC to try to, uh, to, try to purge those things from the, the, the fatty membranes around the, the nerves themselves. Um, glutathione and NAC have no toxic upper limits. It's merely a matter of how much of that sulfur smell you can take at a single moment. Um, I will also mention that there are topical glutathione creams that are available for people that really want to kind of specify the, the area that you're detoxing. So if you've got neuropathy in your fingertips or your feet or whatever, you can actually do those topically as well to really kind of hit those areas hard. Um, and last but not least, your basic antioxidants, vitamin A, C, E, and selenium, those basic antioxidants that help uh, bring the body back into a, a state that not only fights neuropathy, but also things like cancer and osteoporosis. Um, you've got to watch out for vitamin E and vitamin A. Those can get toxic when you push them too hard, but vitamin C, you can push basically to bowel tolerance. And for some people, that may be 500 milligrams a day. But for other people, I've, my advanced cardiovascular patients, for example, are on 40 or 50 grams a day. And they literally just take a couple of spoonfuls at a time. And they say, well, where, where did you get these ideas? Well, I didn't. The Nobel Prize was awarded twice to Dr. Linus Pauling for this kind of work. And I'll tell you, if more people listen to his work on vitamin C and the benefits of high dose of vitamin C, um, we probably would have a lot less cardiovascular surgeons working in America, which may be the reason they didn't push it forward all that much. So, all right. So let's move from general, a general nutritional aspect to how we produce energy inside the cells themselves. Remember, we gotta, we've got to support the energy production of those nerves so they can fire appropriately because that's often where we start having that neuropathy is a lack of firing uh, in a reasonable fashion. So we start with supporting basically the Krebs cycle. Now, this is where biochemistry can get pretty ugly. So without talking about all the individual components of electron transport chains, et cetera, we start off with things like coenzyme Q10. D-ribose, which is a sugar. Don't worry, it's not a sugar that makes you gain weight. It's okay. A uh, little L-carnitine, and I love L-carnitine because it drives fatty acids into these mitochondria to be burned up as fuel. That's why we always add it in our weight loss programs as well. A little magnesium and other trace minerals, and magnesium, like I said, between two and 400 milligrams a day, usually in a divided dose. And then, of course, some B vitamins. Again, we'll talk about those at the very end. Last but not least, the, the fun part about in terms of producing aerobic ac activity in these cells is coconut oil. Um, a lot of the studies for um, activation, there have been some in neuropathy, but it's been shown particularly useful in patients with Alzheimer's disease because these medium chain triglycerides, the very small triglycerides, actually get fed straight into the mitochondria to reactivate them so we got more energy coming out of them to reinvigorate the activity of the nerve. Now on the other side, we can use things like nicotinamide dehydrogen, uh, 
uh, dehydrogenase, uh, NADH, excuse me, uh, malic acid, a little vitamin C to all support the anaerobic side as well. Now, if these look complicated, realize that there's a lot of people far smarter than me that have already put these things together in combinations. There's probably a dozen or more different uh, multivitamins out there that put these things together specifically for mitochondrial support. Um, Individuals, you know, I may parse them together occasionally. I'll do like individual CoQ10 or NADH, uh, certainly high dose B vitamins. Uh, but in a lot of patients that I've seen with neuropathy in particular, um, they find some benefit, I mean, certainly not an end all and be all, but some benefit at a, as a baseline by adding some baseline formulas com combining a lot of these together. Now, as we move further out from there, remember, I want to come back because those mitochondria can become uh, accumulated with toxicity as well. Uh, we always want to make sure that those toxins keep getting flushed out at every step along the way. Um, and to do that, we want to make sure we test appropriately. I'll talk briefly in a second about heavy metals, uh, because when you deal with uh, neuropathy, heavy metal toxicity, particularly in states like Texas, become problematic. Um, in Texas, it's not a matter if you've been exposed to heavy metals, because we all have. It's how your body handles it. And a lot of people have difficulty excreting a lot of these toxins because they have problems with their liver or their kidney. Now, again, those are entire conversations by themselves. But if you have anything on your blood work where you have fatty liver or you've got uh, congestion in the liver or you've got kidney problems, if you're BUN and creatinine, for example, and your blood work is floating a little bit high, and conventional nutritionists should be able to show you this as well as conventional, uh, conventional MDs, uh, but make sure you're looking at your liver and your kidney to make sure your body's able to excrete those. I've listed a few things down there that, that support those of the of the liver support, by the way, I'll always point out that milk thistle is one of your, one of your great go-tos because there's no way you can overdose it. Um, there's literally no toxic upper limit to it, and I've seen people make entire salads out of milk thistle greens. They're, they're a little bitter, but they're not bad, uh, high, in, high in roughage, that sort of thing. Um, and again, because they're detox agents, they can't become toxic themselves, which is nice. So anybody that's worried, well, I'm worried about taking too much of this. You really don't have to. Um, the only thing, uh, I had a, a friend of mine who's bulldog, Brief side note, who was no, bulldogs are notorious for dropping dead of liver failure. Yeah, he kept fill, feeding it milk thistle. Should have been dead in two weeks, lasted another five years. Still debating whether or not that was a good choice on his part, but yeah. <laughs> all right. So all of that to kind of get, before we get into the really fun stuff. Go to your doctor, these are the things we generally want to measure. Number one, a metabolic panel. Let's check out if there are any dysfunctions we need to deal with along the way. Look at your liver enzymes, look at your blood sugar. Let's make sure that there's not something creeping up from any avenue that we haven't looked at so far. Look at your thyroid panel, okay? Uh, your nerves require a lot of metabolic energy in order to keep functioning, and the primary driver for that metabolism is your thyroid. Now, again, this is an entire lecture off uh, unto itself, but if you're having your thyroid, thyroid panel run and your doctor says you're fine and you still feel fatigued, realize that they're probably not measuring everything they need to. The big number that they look at when they look at, at thyroid is TSH, and yet that is horribly inaccurate when it comes to looking at actual thyroid function. This is my own interpretation, um, but it's also the interpretation that a lot of functional medicine practitioners also follow. If you're going to be looking at the thyroid panel, the two numbers to have your doctors look at is your free T3 and TPO antibodies. Now, you want to know the TPO antibodies because you want to make sure that there's not an autoimmune response going on. If you haven't identified an autoimmune component yet, this is an opportunity to be able to see if, that, if it's there. The second thing you want to do is look at that free T3 value because free, free functional T3 is the free circulating hormone in your bloodstream, and yet it's the thing that is most often overlooked by conventional endocrinologists. The magic number you're looking for there is a 3.5 or greater. Just because it's within their normal ranges doesn't necessarily mean it's within optimal. And I want to see that 3.5 or greater, usually no higher than about a 4.2 on the free T3. There's a reason that thyroid support constitutes about 30% of my practice. Look at nitric oxide. Now, nitric oxide is a vasodilator, okay, which means it helps uh, get your blood vessels nice and open and helps deliver oxygen to those tissues, including your nerves, because again, being very metabolically active, they need a lot of oxygen to run. Nitric oxide is one of those things that if you need it, you absolutely need it, and if you don't, it's not gonna do you any harm. However, being a good steward of your healthcare dollar, I'd say always check first. There are some very easy salivary assays. Take about two seconds to run because it's a little dipstick. You put it on your tongue. If it turns bright, bright pink, you're doing fine. 
We've got those available at any of the people's pharmacies around town. It's run through a company called Neogensis Labs down at Houston. Um, the leading expert in the world on nitric oxide therapy and testing is Dr. Nathan Bryan there at the University of Texas Health Science Center. He's a good friend of ours. Um, and he not only developed the assay to see if it's a problem, but also develops a way to fix it. Because the conventional approach is to use something like L-arginine. Well, the problem with that is you have to take like six grams at a, at a time. So if, unless you've got a spoon ready, okay, it's very difficult to try to keep that dosage up. Um, and the older we are, the more arginine we need. The, Formulas that we use now are a little L-ornithine and some beetroot extract. Don't worry, it doesn't taste like beets. <laughs> I don't like beets. Um, but they work quite well to actually generate nitric oxide in the body. Um, we want to make sure that there's plenty of oxygen going to the nerves. Check out your hormone balance. Well, I'm postmenopausal. I don't care. You need to have some hormones. Um, the areas of the world where people typically do best uh, later and later into their lives, they usually have some detectable levels of hormones. Now, not not where you were when you were in your 20s, okay? But we need something there because, for example, progesterone, and lots of studies have been done to substantiate this, progesterone in particular has a very strong anti-inflammatory effect upon nerves. Um, testosterone has similar effects in men, but even men need a little progesterone for that same effect. Um, after the Women's Health Initiative study, one of the things they pointed out was that progesterone itself needed some additional, needed some additional investigation because of its known very potent neurotrophic, neurotrophic activities. In fact, in some people with traumatic brain injuries, just a little bit of progesterone keeps the swelling on the brain down, calms down the inflammation on the nerves, and the rates of survival are double in those people that have a little bit of progesterone given to them in the first 11 hours after a traumatic brain injury. If it has that kind of effect upon a traumatic injury, it certainly has similar effects upon long-term neuropathies peripherally. So don't rule out the fact that hormones are important for both men and women. Get them checked, and if, they, and if you need it, have them supported. Not necessarily HRT, but have them looked at and see what, what needs to be done. Have them run a couple of, uh, then we get into this fun stuff. And these are these four I'm going to be talking about in the next couple of sections because these are the fun ones. These are the ones that conventional medicine typically doesn't cover, and all, cover very well, but they're things that alternative uh, practitioners like myself deal with every day, namely food allergies, heavy metals, and uh, testing neurotransmitters. And then we'll wrap up by talking about those B vitamins, your methylation static, status and your nutrigenomics. All right. Now, food allergies... Uh, and when I say food allergies, I'm talking about a, a broad term. If you talk to a, uh, an, uh, an allergist, they will say that the only allergies out there are mediated through IgE. Well, it's fine. But there's five different antibodies in your bloodstream, and they're just worried about this one little antibody off to the side. When I'm talking about food allergies, I'm using this as an umbrella term to talk about all immune-based responses to the foods that you eat. Bear with me. You'll see where I'm going in a second. Now, food allergies or intolerances can generate various neuropathies in your body through a couple of means. Now remember, there are more neurons in your intestines than there are in your central nervous system. It has to coordinate 30-odd feet of tubing. Therefore, anything that is inflammatory to your gut will throw off the neurochemistry of the enteric nervous system and therefore start affecting both your peripheral and central nervous systems as well. Now, if you've got a food allergy and it's causing inflammation in the gut, okay, by directly uh, disrupting key nutrients absorption, you can disrupt iron, magnesium, B12, and all the rest of those things that I mentioned earlier. Maybe you're not taking those pharmaceuticals, but you may be eating something that's causing the same degree of problems in your intestines. Two, if you've got something that's inflamed in your intestines, even if you're absorbing things relatively right, that inflammation can build up and cause problems in other systems as well, including your peripheral nervous system. Um, there are some studies through the University of Chicago, for example, showing very strongly that celiac disease and peripheral neuropathy are very strongly linked. Third, and this is the most damaging, in my opinion, so if you've got a food allergy, remember that you've got this huge component of your, of, of your nervous system in your gut, but it's also home to about three-quarters of your immune system. Um, three-quarters of your immune system is what we call secretory IgA, and it hangs out in your intestinal lining which makes sense because it's the largest biochemical exposure your body has to the world around you. So if I've got this immune system in my gut and I've had something that my body starts attacking on, a, on, a, on an immunologic level, as I start fighting this off, uh, off more and more, I'll actually start developing an autoimmune response. And the, the, that happens through a process we call, oh, excuse me, Get to that in a second. Um, that happens through cross-reactivity that basically the things that things on your 
food that you're reacting to looks similar to structures um, in, in your own body. And that's where you start getting uh, positive ANA, positive reactions against your thyroid, positive um, osteophyte antibodies, where you start developing autoimmune-driven osteoporosis. There's a component of that with Alzheimer's. Certainly, there are strong components of that with peripheral neuropathies. And there's bound to be one or two of you sitting in here at least. The last talk we, ha we had had at least a half dozen um, that ha whose, uh, whose neuropathy was being driven forward by autoimmune conditions. If you have an autoimmune condition, you need to have your food allergies looked at. Now, conventional allergists, when you go to them and talk to them about food allergy testing, they'll kind of roll their eyes a little bit and maybe they'll run a celiac panel. Understand those tests only crop up positive when your gut is 80% gone. So the rate of false negatives on the conventional blood test are huge. Or they'll do the death by a thousand paper cut thing. We've all seen it. You know, you go to the allergist and they do all those little cuts on your arm or your back or something and you look like you're like a refugee from Gitmo, okay? <laughs> Um, not really a great way to go. And bluntly, those are horribly inaccurate because unless you're eating through your skin, that's not where the immune response needs to take place. So if they're positive, yeah, that tells you something, but if they're negative, the rates of false negatives on the tests are huge for food specifically. I got a better alternative though. There are a variety of labs out there like Cyrex and the one that I prefer, US Biotech, that actually can go through and through a very simple serum test, two or three vials of blood, They'll test 96 different foods and ship them off to a lab and see what you're reacting to. Now, US Biotech I like, number one, because it's the cheapest of all the labs that are available and it's got the best data, which is a good combination for me. Um, and in this case, it actually combines looking at three different antibodies, IgA, IgG, and IgE, so I can see not only what you're having a reaction to, but where that's taking place. So for example, I can say that, okay, this particular person's having a strong reaction to everything in the dairy category. So I know that their issues are being very strongly controlled by a dairy response. Dairy is probably genetic, so is gluten that this person is also, also positive to. Egg, they're having a reaction against everything in the egg category, and that's number three on the list. Egg is one of those, eh, there's a lot of genetics, but there's also a lot of environmental because, let's face it, we eat a lot of eggs. It's not only what we eat for breakfast, it's also baked into every, almost every baked good we've got. So there's a lot of people that develop this. Now the reason I bring up the egg, uh, the egg in particular is because you can acquire allergies over time. If my body's all revved up and it's having a reaction against say gluten or dairy, and it's, my, it's throwing its immune response at it day after day after day, and at the same time I'm having eggs, you know, eggs for breakfast, and you know, maybe I'm a, you know, I, I like having some, you know, a lot of baked goods, so I've got eggs coming into those as well. Eventually, because I'm having it exposed day after day after day and the immune system's hyperactivated, I'll start developing this cross-reactivity. But what happens if I, my body starts seeing something in my, uh, my immune system starts seeing, seeing something in my body that looks very similar? What we call that is cross-reactivity. So, for example, here's, uh, here's an antibody, okay, against, say, gluten down here. Very positive response. But what if I have something that has a little bit where that antibody locks onto, that looks like gluten but isn't the same epitope. This is a similar cross-reactivity or has something that's even less specific but even general binding. These cross-reactivities not only allow your body to generate more food allergies, so for example, this person's cropped up positive to, uh, no, barley, to tomato, okay? I don't think he has a tomato allergy, okay? It's possible, but it's unlikely. I think he's developed an allergy against tomato, why? Because he's probably eating it on a regular basis and that cross-reactivity is pushed forward. But what if that cross-reactivity, if that little bit of, of, of antigenicity here looks similar to my thyroid gland? I start developing Hashimoto's. Well, if, what if it looks similar to my, uh, my pancreas? I start developing type 1.5 diabetes. Um, well, what if I've got, you know, but what if it cross-reacts against, oh, myelin basin protein or something? Well, now I'm developing autoimmune-based neuropathies. And this is this case where you're not going to fix this by giving them another drug. You can shut down the nerves, but the whole point is you have to remodulate the immune system. You have to strip back the layers and ask why the body is having this response. So what you need to do is actually start pulling back the things that are causing it in the first place. Alter the diet. Now, a lot of those people say, well, hang on. This, you're putting a lot of steps together and my MD never told me about this. You know, I want some proof on this. Fine, here's the array, the array 5 from Cyrex. We can run that and I can show you the autoantibodies that are driven forward in response to these food allergies that'll link together those two factors, including in this case, intrinsic factor, so how you absorb your B12, and all of those ones down off to the, off to the right that, are that directly affect the, the nervous system.
we can actually measure the direct autoantibodies attacking the parts of your central and peripheral nervous system causing these neuropathies. Now, this is where I know exactly what my, my opinion is worth because this test runs about $800 the last time I checked. And I, figure out my, I figured out that my, wor my word is worth about $500. You know, I want to run a food allergy test on you. Okay, how much that'll cost? Well, about $270. Okay, we can do that. Um, I want to run this other test, you know, to, to, run for auto, to, to, to run for autoantibodies to show that it's attacking these various systems. Well, okay, how much will that, will that, will that cost? About $800. I'll take your word for it. <laughs> At that point, and the other point is that I don't run a lot of these tests because it doesn't change what we do. If you've already got the neuropathy and I've tested a positive ANA and you've got a bunch of food allergies, I don't need to fill in the middle gap because all it's doing is wasting your money. We can do it. And there have been a couple of people that's like, I'm not going to believe you. And I'm like, okay, <laughs> it's not making me any money, but there you go. Um, so you can prove this every step along the way. And again, a lot of this data, by the way, is also substantiated by, by information out of the University of Chicago. So it's not just my opinion or the people from Cyrex or the people from US Biotech, okay? but if you go to the University of Chicago, not exactly what you'd call a low tier, tier institution, they have an entire center there for celiac disease study that they talk about the link between food allergies and various issues in the body, including peripheral neuropathies. Now, what do we do once we figure this out? Number one, come off the foods that are reactive. Two, go back and reseal your gut. And here's a kind of, kind of a, a laundry list of things to start with. And you'll start off with things like enzymes. You can use ones particularly high in DPP-4. You can use a little colostrum if you're not sensitive to, to dairy, which also calms the gut down and rebalances the immune system. Um, a big component of those are the proline-rich polypeptides, these PRPs. And again, if this is going too fast, remember, all of these are just kind of a general outline. Um, various practitioners use various combinations of these, and a lot of, uh, a lot of nutraceutical companies actually have a bunch of these, these things packaged together. Don't worry about getting it. I want you to get to the idea that there is a natural approach to this. So anti-inflammatories and enzymes and colostrum, a little vitamin D to reseal that gut back together. It's a hormonal signal, a little fish oil and turmeric. Gee, those anti-inflammatories we talked about a few minutes ago. Butyric acid, sulfur fengucosinolate, which is a really fancy way of saying broccoli. Which turns out my grandmother was right the entire time. Uh, except it's concentrated. I can take like two pills of SGS. It's equivalent of like two pounds of raw broccoli. I'm like, see, I don't have to eat my greens. I can, <laughs> I can cheat around it. Um, a little glutamine to reseal the gut. And last but not least, those probiotics. Because the probiotics not only reseal the gut, not only get the gut functioning the way that it's supposed to, but it also helps us as people with neuropathy because it helps generate those B vitamins we need to start feeding into our nerves again. So, like I said, this is kind of a basic place to start. You can add or subtract off of that list, but the whole point, once you start modifying the diet, you can reseal the gut and start modulating the immune system behind it to stop the, uh, the progression of the autoimmune response that's attacking those nerves in the first place. Now, as we move kind of forward into this, we want to talk briefly about heavy metal. Well, maybe not this kind of metal. <laughs> All right, there are lots of, there is lots of evidence from the literature specifically linking various forms of heavy metal contamination with dysfunctions of, nerve, uh, of nerves. Now, this is fibromyalgia, this is uh, various neuropathies, this is um, central nervous system dysfunctions, et cetera, et cetera. But the whole point is that heavy metal has been shown consistently in the literature to cause these kind of not only dysfunctions in the peripheral nerves, but in the central nervous system as well. How do you test it? Because it's always, well, okay, this is nice, but we want to make sure that this is the case for the individual. The way to test this is a very easy urinary test, okay? Doctor's data allows us to send it a urinary sample, usually under provocative challenge, i.e., we give you a couple of pills to take right before you go to bed, and you take first pass urine in the morning. And you take that first pass urine, you ship it off to the lab. Let me repeat this. You take the urine and ship it off to the lab. You do not bring it into my office. There's a reason I no longer reply to the phrase, hey, come look at this. <laughs> All right. And in this patient's case, for example, we may have high levels of lead or mercury, both of which we know affects what's, uh, affect your nerves. Now, what you use to get that out depends upon what heavy metal may be a problem. For lead, for example, and that's quite common, is EDTA. That's available over the counter. For Mercury, however, things get a little more difficult. DMSA and DMPS are usually the top ones we use, and those are unfortunately at this point by prescription only. 
The federal government, in its infinite wisdom, about a year and a half ago, decided that things that we've been using over the counter that have been perfectly safe for the last 40 years all of a sudden should be taken away. I'm waiting for the day they take away all pointed scissors and make us deal with those awful rounded tip ones. Okay, well, Big Brother decided we can't do this anymore. However, this is by prescription. So if this flares up, this is where we go back to your treating physicians, your MDs, and so on and so forth, and say, hey, we've shown by excretion a high level of mercury that's likely to be, uh, dealing, uh, likely to be deleterious to this patient. Can we work with you to try to get that prescription to get it out? So again, you test first because you don't know what you want to do until you figure out what the problem is. But you need to use the science because if I just throw a generic chelator at this, if I just go with this randomly, I may or may not get what I need to. And the advantage of using scientific testing is you can go back later and check to see if you're making progress because there's no point in replicating something month after month if it's not actually working for you. All right. And again, various treatments for heavy metals kind of depends upon what you need and there are natural and pharmaceutical approaches to each. Now, depending upon what practitioner you're working with, some things work a little more aggressively than others. Um, lead, for example, re responds to virtually everything, whereas mercury does not. The natural stuff works kind of uh, half and half on most of them. Uh, I'll be honest, I don't think it works quite as well on mercury, but again, you need to work with your providers. And there's a couple of different options for these chelations. You can do them orally, you can do them by rectal suppositories, or you can do them by IVs. Um, all of them have various risks and, uh, and benefits to them. So again, depending upon what provider you're working with, you have various options to make that happen. All right. Now, one of the other things that heavy metals will uh, throw a monkey wrench into the middle of is your neurotransmitters. Now, your body, re your body requires adequate function of your cells to generate your serotonin, to generate your dopamine, your epinephrine, norepinephrine, et cetera. Um, I do not know why to this day, why conventional medicine does not test your neurotransmitters. It makes sense to me, okay? If the nerves themselves are not working the way that they're supposed to, whether that's in your brain and you're getting depression or in your periphery and you're getting neuropathy, why don't we actually t look at those chemicals that, have the, that allow those cells to talk to each other? It makes sense, doesn't it? And yet they don't. Um, even with conventional, even with uh, therapy for fibromyalgia, they'll randomly throw things to affect serotonin at them but they don't test serotonin to see if the, it's the issue. The problem with neurotransmitters is there are hundreds of different neurotransmitters that may be causing the problem. Now, there's the top five or six of them out there, um, but essentially, if, unless you test, you're not gonna know how to approach it. So test your neurotransmitters mineral levels, and then you can use targeted amino acid therapy to try to, alternate, to, to, uh, uh, to alter them as you need, need to. Now, amino acids, again, are just those little, little bits that make up your, your proteins. So I'm talking about essentially nothing more complicated than eating a lot of, say, turkey sandwiches to try to get your serotonin levels up. None of these are pharmaceuticals. They're all natural substances in your bodies. Now, to give you an idea of the players on the field that we're talking about, your neurotransmitters are divided into two basic categories. You have excitatory neurotransmitters and inhibitory neurotransmitters. Excitatory neurotransmitters are the ones that get your nerves active. They're, they're, they're revved up. They're talking to one another. They're getting a lot of transmission back and forth. The inhibitory ones are the ones that calm your brain down. They let you feel better. They let you sleep. They get your mood feeling okay. Um, the running joke in the world, for example, is that you, you don't really enjoy anything except dopamine and serotonin. Everything else is just a way to get there. Okay? Um, but, don't, but serotonin, GABA, and dopamine make up your three basic inhibitory neurotransmitters. All of them have basic, uh, basic amino acids that are used to help boost those levels up as well. Balancing these out, on the other hand, are a bunch of excitatory neurotransmitters, including things like glutamate, norepinephrine, and epinephrine. Now, dopamine can have an excitatory quality as well because dopamine, although it's inhibitory, directly manufactures norepinephrine and epinephrine underneath it. So if you kind of overload the, epi the dopamine pathways, hey, we're really happy about it. Unfortunately, it starts giving you excitatory things on the backside. Why this is important? Because it is common to have an overabundance of excitatory neurotransmitters that literally are excitotoxic, okay? They excite those neurons to the point that they kind of burn themselves out. This is the same process by which artificial sweeteners often end up causing neurologic problems as well. Now, I will tell you my first experience with neuropathy is actually with an optic neuropathy that occurred in my own mother because of aspartame poisoning back in the mid 80s. And the entire brain trust down at MD Anderson grumpily turned around and said, well, you probably have a tumor, we just can't find it, and gave her, gave her up, gave up on her after about $10,000 worth of testing. 
Now, being a smart woman, she says, look, I can't do any worse than they did. She wrote down everything she ate or drank, and the only thing that was consistent was Diet Cokes because it was the NutraSweet that was in there that was an excitotoxin. Fast forward a couple of years, uh, Dr. Russell Blaylock wrote this extensive book called Excitotoxins, talking about, how, uh, exci about excitotoxicity and particularly how um, these uh, artificial sweeteners can cause this excitotoxicity in your body. Now, part of the reason I bring this up is this DL-phenylalanine that manufactures dopamine is part of NutraSweet. So when you talk about the two components of, uh, of aspartame, for example, NutraSweet, it's aspartic acid and DL-phenylalanine, which is part of the reason they have those warning labels on it. And this is the pathway by which that NutraSweet comes in, boosts up your excitatory neurotransmitters so that these are in excess, imbalances the neurotransmitters, and burns out the nerves. That's how that whole process works. And that's why it's also associated with things like blindness and headaches and, I don't know, the desire to go to law school or something. I don't know. All right, so, but we gotta know this, okay? This is, a, this is a seesaw, and if I'm balancing this out, I've gotta be able to balance both sides before I realize what's going on. So you can test this. Again, very simple urinary test. You go home, you know, you pee in a couple of tubes, you ship it off to the lab, they send me the results a couple of weeks later, and I get a breakdown of exactly what all of these neurotransmitters look like. So in this case, for example, I have a patient that may come back and they've got reasonable levels of serotonin. Well, okay automatically that tells me that this isn't a serotonin-based issue, and yet the vast majority of medications focus in on serotonin. That's not where we need to go. GABA's doing okay, so my inhibitory ones are doing all right. My dopamine is through the roof. There's something that's pushing this forward. Now I can go back and ask, are you, you know, you're drinking anything with artificial sweeteners? Let's talk about your diet. Is there anything that may be pushing that forward? Um, in this case, I also noticed they got elevated glutamate and histamine. Well, histamine links back to what we talked about earlier because histamine is elevated in those cases where you have food allergies. So now I have a way of double checking that my issues in my nervous system are going on because of what's going on in my gut as well. So I can feed back and say, okay, I can drop that histamine by diet. Glutamate opens up, opens up this whole can of worms beyond it called uh, methylation. I'll talk about that in a second. Okay? But as I break this patient down, I can instantly see what neurotransmitters may be elevated and start targeting this amino acid therapy based upon what I'm measuring to actually start balancing their brain out. Now, this may be 5-HTP, this could be GABA, in this case, probably a little L-thenine, some oxaloacetate, you know, a little bit of this, a little bit of that, but all these are natural substances. Natural substances your body metabolizes to balance out your neurotransmitters, and we're doing it in a measured and scientifically viable fashion, not just kind of generically throwing a medication at it and seeing what your response is. Because in this person's case, for example, if I gave them serotonin, if I gave them an SSRI, it's not going to have any effect. Well, this won't work. It doesn't mean their nerves aren't inflamed. It doesn't mean that there is an approach that needs to be taken. It means you didn't measure, you made an assumption, and you missed the diagnosis. So measure, don't, don't guess at it. Now, the reason I brought up that whole glutamate issue is because it brings us into our last bit. Again, I'm trying to hit the major, major points. Um, if that glutamate is elevated, it opens up the door to what we call nutrigenomics. Now, hang on here. When I give this lecture to other doctors, this takes about six hours to get through. I'm gonna do the 30,000 foot flying overview because essentially what you're looking at here is a light switch. Because when you deal with methylation, you're no longer talking about a disease state in the body, you're talking about a fundamental cellular process. That fundamental cellular process is by which the body generates CH3, a methyl group, okay? It's like a, link, it's like a, a Lego. Okay? And the body uses that methyl group, that biochemical Lego, to build other things throughout your body. It can build your neurotransmitters. Oh, all that stuff we just talked about over here. It can use it to turn on or off your genes or on and off your enzymes. It's like a light switch. So if I can go over and flip on and off that light switch, I don't know if that's attached to the lights in here or the floodlights around the Taj Mahal or to you know, the, the, the dim Edison bulb hooked up, hooked up over the back door. Okay? I don't know what it's doing, but I know that it's the process of turning something on or off. That whole process requires a cycle between methionine and homocysteine that takes place in every cell in your body. Now, each time this churns, it shoves off a methyl group that your body uses, like flipping on or off that light. Interesting side note, if this grinds to a halt, you get elevations often in homocysteine, which has been strongly implicated in blood tests for both cardiovascular disease and Alzheimer's. Now, not a lot of direct implication between 
uh, homocysteine and peripheral neuropathies. However, I'm fairly sure that, I'd be, uh, that I'm suspicious about it if it was. Now, bringing it back to our original argument though, because to keep this, think of it like a machine, to keep this wheel spinning, I have to keep this wheel spinning as the drive shaft, and this, and this drive shaft is 5-methyl tetrahydrofolate, or MTHFR, a methylene tetrahydrofolate reductase. <laughs> yeah, don't, don't, ever, don't ever get in a Scrabble game with me. You will lose. <laughs> okay, and exactly, because it's like, well, what the heck is methylene tetrahydrofolate? It's B9. That's all it is. It's how your body handles not your folic acid, but your methylfolate. Now, if you've got a genetic dysfunction where this copy of this gene doesn't work quite right, Okay. Essentially, you've got a drive shaft of a, you know, you've, you've got a, a Ferrari engine being driven forward by a Hyundai, okay? You don't have the speed to keep it up. You're not generating enough of those methyl groups to keep it functional. And everything else we talked about so far becomes a problem because on the genetic level, your body can't generate methyl groups because it doesn't handle methyl, uh, doesn't handle folic acid well. Now, methyl folate, not folic acid. There's like 12 steps between the artificial and synthetic folic acid that they enrich things with and the actual folate that our body is used to using. And by the way, if folate sounds like foliage, it should for a reason because the reason this isn't a problem in people that eat right is because if you're eating enough green leafy vegetables, that foliage, you should be getting enough of the activated B9 to make this happen. But if you've got a neuropathy and you're already behind, I don't care if you eat a forest, you may not be able to offset this without supplemental help. So this is driving this forward, okay? This, this is our drive shaft that, that pushes it forward, and it's linked between B9 and the rest of this cycle through these two genes called MTR and MTR that basically describe how your body utilizes, ready for it, B12 and B6. So now I've got my big three, B9, B6, and B12 that are all implicated in the single regulatory point in my body by which I generate those methyl groups that activate or deactivate everything else in the body. That's why at the very beginning, all those medications that cause problems with B vitamins, um, and by the way, hormone imbalance will also give you B vitamin deficiencies, okay? Um, all of those medications, all of those disease states that throw off your B vitamin status. If I'm using antacids that throw down my B12, this is why it starts grinding all of this to a halt. Now, like any machine that's pushed forward, I also have a braking mechanism, and that braking mechanism is, is tied into how my body handles uh, sulfur, particularly the cysthione beta synthase pathway. Funnily enough, also requires vitamin B6. Starting to see all the, how all these things fit together. And how I know that this is the case on blood, work, on, on blood work is because that glutamate level starts increasing. So now I've got a couple of different ways that I can start measuring that this is the problem. If I'm suspecting this, then I go back and do genetic testing. Now, I want to tell you, you've got a good idea. Let me take you from that small model to the big model. Hang on, because this gets complicated. So here's that same cycle I showed you earlier, okay? Here's the methionine and homocysteine. Here's the B9 cycle, right? Here's that CBS strain, okay? Let me show you how this is tied into everything else in your body. So as I start tearing this diagram apart, okay? Here's my SAMe, which generates CoQ10. We already talked about why that's important, involved with cardiovascular issues as well. Here's my RNA and DNA involved with my cellular function. There's my creatinine involved with uh, my, my kidneys. There's my adenosine for ATP and DNA production. Here's my homocysteine for cardiovascular issues as well as Alzheimer's disease. Here's ammonia for kidney and, and protein uh, production. There's glutathione for my detox. Remember I talked about that earlier? You see how all these things are tied into it. Okay. Here's my angiotensin, so if I've got an inflammatory response or if I've got blood pressure issues, this starts cropping up. Here's my GABA that's involved with my sleep and my mood, one of my primary inhibitory neurotransmitters as we tie all of these concepts together. Here's my dopamine and norepinephrine, which is also, by the way, tied into Parkinson's disease, okay? Um, my dad actually was one of the leading researchers on MAOA, specifically dealing with Parkinson's disease for about 30 years. It was really odd to come full circle, and after starting out in my, my professional life as a lab assistant at his lab, come full circle and now talk about this as a clinical scientist from the other side. Here's my MAOA, dealing with Parkinson's and depression. Here's glutamate for my pain response, by the way. So you've got that tingling peripheral neuropathy. Glutamate's often part of that. Here's my superoxide dismutase involved with my antioxidant potential. By the way, that's also cancer risk. 
Um, this is also how your body helps detox a lot of these anti-cancer agents, the chemotherapy agents that come into your body. As I fast forward from there, here's my section on vasodilation, tying it back into nitro nitric oxide. From there, my purines for DNA metabolism. And last but not least, the Krebs cycle, the things that all of those mitochondria I was talking about are using to generate the energy in my cells. Now, you don't have to repeat this. I just want to give you an idea how we start with this very simple concept on the genetic level, and it rapidly snowballs into this huge thing where it's affecting every other system in the body. And you can rapidly see how this is going to turn your nerves on fire. All right. Now, if you're getting basic genetics work, there are four, t four things, and I mentioned these earlier that need to be looked at, MTHFR, COMT, MTR and MTR, and in CBS. Um, I will tell you that there are a lot of doctors out there who are starting to learn about this. Nobody is an expert. So if you get anybody that says that they're an expert on this subject, you do one of these and run, because no, we are learning more and more every day about this subject matter. I've got graduate degrees in biochemistry and genetics, and even I have to keep reading to try to keep up with it, because we are discovering something new every week. So what are you going to do about it? A little activated B12, B, uh, B9, a little trimethylglycine, some SAMe. Okay, again, we can go over these in detail depending upon if you need them. But again, test, don't guess. Make sure that these are issues that you need to deal with. Um, like two. <laughs> um, you can run basic analysis and actually see whether or not these are the issues or not. Make sure that you test before you start just randomly throwing things. Otherwise, you're not going to know whether or not you're using the appropriate, uh, the appropriate approach. So upshot from everything I've told you so far, there are tests for all of these individual problems that may be out there. Start with the individual disease states you've got and the medications you're on. Realize there are various nutritional deficiencies that can be caused from those. But then on these, these other subjects, the more advanced things that most people don't look at, look at food allergies, look at heavy metals, look at methylation issues, look at your neurotransmitters, and realize that there are tests along the way to show and, and determine exactly what the problem is for each of your individual biochemical problems. All right, any questions? Yeah, yeah, yeah.